This film I've discovered that people can't take the amount of voices I have in my head and so I really wanted to show you what it's like to be inside my head and unfortunately in doing so it confuses people the disconnected jumps that I make and the discontinuity that is the story, the, the, the narration that goes on in my head. So I had to clean it up some, but I tried to leave the disjointedness that I live with in the film. It's a story that goes back and forth and it's told in the stilted manner that I think. The other thing that you'll find in this video is that there are pops and clicks, there is out of sync audio, there is where it's out of sync and then it'll begin to sync up and these are things that I used to show the auditory hallucinations that I have. Oftentimes I get a disconnect between, well I hesitate to call it reality, but I get a disconnect between reality and when it happens to me. And so I tried to emulate this as best I could. Okay, I have no clue what to say. I know I'm going to Colorado and I know I need to talk to you. But I don't know what to say. All the revisiting that I'm going to do, it's going to be healthy for me, but I'm not looking forward to it because I don't know what it's going to do to me emotionally. I'll have a good friend there. My sister, really. She'll be there through all of it for me. She's driving me everywhere and I'm staying at her house. Her and her mom will make it an exciting trip. A heartwarming trip and a fun trip. No matter how hard it may be. Emotionally, we don't know if Jerry's going to see me. We don't know if the buildings are still standing. We don't know any of that. I know that the company that ran the last apartment that we had is closed. They're the ones that wouldn't take the money, and we ended up in the street. And I think you're off kilter. Not that I'm not. How are we doing this? Are we doing... What's the freaking timeline again? Are we homeless in Denver for well, cause just one night or what? 
No, we were homeless. How, well, how the hell did it happen? We were, when we left that apartment, we left that apartment and we stayed with them for the first week after that apartment, after they kicked us out of that apartment. Then when they kicked us out, we spent <clears throat> two nights, two, three nights on the streets, didn't we? Yeah. Yeah, well, I had been dealing with the legal side of it, mostly because I was working less than you, or I wasn't working, I can't remember for sure. But uh, I was there more than you, and so, like, I, I was there when they served the process, and, you know, they, they knock on the door, you open the door, and they're holding it like this, a click, you get a camera, and they shove it in the door and walk away, you know. So I freaked the guy out, see, because we were expecting it, so I'm like, oh, thanks, dude. He stopped, turned around. You're welcome. I'm like, I know, so you're just doing your job. I know it's not, it's not personal. <laughs> you know, I just freaked him out, though. <clears throat> Still, though, we wound up homeless in Denver, Colorado. And I know it's said starting this in May, but no, this was back in December or January. December or January, we wound up homeless the first time. <clears throat> and <laughs> all of a sudden we're out in the freaking streets on that first night, you know, and it snowed, of course, it's Denver in, in the freaking middle of winter. Uh, so we had to sleep in shifts, individual shifts, down by a creek that's a slash park in Denver. Um, it's kind of kind of sunk down so they can't see you from the road. It, it was pretty, pretty safe, but still we could have got a, a camping ticket. At the time, you couldn't do that. If you set up a town on a city, you know, city, on city property, let's say, you know, sidewalk or whatever, you set up a tent, they'd have you, and if you're lucky, they would just take your tent down and give you a ticket, okay? Most likely, they would arrest you. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just, it's the standard society's response to everything, you know, criminalized poverty, criminalized homelessness. <clears throat> but still, we slept in like, you know, 20 minute, half hour shifts each because if you both go to sleep, you're liable to wake up hypothermic if you wake up at all, you know, because it's definitely below freezing, you know. At one point, it got so cold, we both got up and walked over to uh, the, under the bridge to have a, a light, you know, like pretty much just every bridge in the world, world does. And we were warming our hands as much as we could by that flipping light, you know, that was the only source of heat we had for two days. <clears throat>
ignored, bereft, angry, contemptible, worthless. You know, embittered. I mean, you could squash a baby bird in front of me, I'd be like, eh, whatever. I got teeth. I got my top teeth. Um, I don't really know what else to say other than I got my teeth. I'm going to have to learn how to talk and I'm going to have to learn how to work with them. But I got my teeth. I can now go out and smile and not have people look at me funny. I can I can work without a mask on. I don't have to worry about it anymore. I, uh, I got my teeth. I don't know how else to say it. I've waited three years to get teeth. I've gone without teeth in the top of my mouth for three years. Something that you don't realize gives you self-esteem. We told you, did we, tell, we told that story, you know, the sheriff showed up as well as the, the, uh, the management company's movers and, you know, proceeded to grab all of our shit and put it right out on the front lawn. You know, it's in the video. I might have to do an arrow or a circle or something, but it's in, it's in the video of, of that place. And so while our friends are taking us to the hotel with what we can carry, since we had enough for one week at the, the weekly hotel, um, we were watching people carry off our stuff, <laughs> you know, that we had accumulated over the last five years. So this was the place that... Where you lived with no electricity? Yep. It's, it's so hard to imagine. I, it's hard for me to conceptualize <clears throat> being able to survive that long without electricity, for one. And, um... God, you guys really lived across the street and next door to some really beautiful classic architecture. I mean, I don't blame you for wanting to live down here. It's yeah, gorgeous. It's a... Will I have a place to sleep tonight? Will I have food to eat? Will I... And I know these are questions that I asked when I went on out of the streets, where will I sleep? Where will I eat? What will I eat? How will I eat? And, you know, we didn't want to stay in Denver or in Colorado for that matter because we were getting embittered and angry all the time. And I didn't want to live like that. You know, we've seen other people, you know, older than us, just, and then we've seen people move there from, like, like California. We saw people move there from California, just, it killed them. Sometimes, literally, you know, just the, they couldn't get a job, they couldn't make enough money, oh my God, you know, I can't do this, it's like, you know, we didn't have this or that. And just hold on, they would all, you know, either become angry and embittered, uh, usually chemical dependent on something, you know, or they'd go running and screaming back to California. <laughs> you know, when we were kicked out of that apartment, it was... We did everything we could. We tried to give them money. And they said no. And we were removed. And that's where I, I broke the first time. And now I'm going back and I'm going to revisit those places. And 
I don't even know if the buildings are still standing. And I don't know how that'll make me feel one way or the other. Or if there's another altogether. Something else we lost was homelessness. Was there a cat? I don't find that one out. <laughs> yeah. Miss him. He was a good boy. Yeah. Try to do a little butter belt. <laughs> he, he would it, lay well, down the eat. Well, he was just soft, pudgy fat. You know, I mean, sir, he's hard, pudgy fat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Twist was just. <laughs> kind of like pushing on a plum. <laughs> no, he was softer than a plum. <laughs> sort of like pushing on a rotten plum. Well, that a peach. <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> Delicate little guy. Oh, but he was oh, sweet. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, there we were. Anyway, that was our first little bout of homelessness that definitely changed us. And then, some, what, three months, four months later, in May, yeah. you know, <clears throat> and through a series of unfortunate events that were not our fault. We did everything right, but we had just finished our little stint as nannies and couldn't handle that because the pay was way too low and the conditions were ridiculous. So we were living in a hotel and this is the motel, this is a Motel 5, mind you, not a Motel 6, not a you know, Econo Inn or anything. No, Motel 5. Okay, that tells you everything you know. <clears throat> anyway, that was going to run out at the end of the week. So, <laughs> we were looking at being homeless, you know, and this would have been the second time we were homeless in Denver. And homelessness in Denver in 2002 was just, it was horrible. There weren't shelters like there are now. I had lost my job for demanding money for overtime. And I lost my job because I insisted that they pay for the doctor because I got hurt on the job. Uh-huh. Which they didn't want to do. So, uh, money was running out, and of course you can't stay at the hotel for free. But I mean, you're the one that lived down here. I mean... Well, we didn't drive, sweetie. We didn't have oh. a car. Well, I guess I just didn't think of it because buses sometimes take the highway if they're going a long way. I just don't. Can I tell you something? Yeah? Well, I couldn't really, I couldn't really express myself properly the other night when we were talking about when you guys were homeless here because I just couldn't get it out. But I think the thing that bugs me is, um, it's hard to say out loud because I think I'm going to cry like a bitch right now. Um, I really missed you a lot. I didn't understand why you quit talking to me. I didn't know where you went, or you know what I mean? So I worried about you constantly before you ever got a hold of me. And I think, I think I was just, when I realized that you guys had been here for a long time before you went to San Francisco, I had a lot of mixed feelings about it. Like, it wasn't just, wasn't just about you know, I would have done this, I would have done that. It was more like, my feelings were really hurt that you didn't want to reconnect. I felt like, why did she disappear and just never talk to me again? Because I couldn't think of any fight we had. I couldn't think of any, I and mean, I wasn't disapproving of Emery. I didn't really know him very well, but he always seemed nice. He was never a dick to me ever at school, so. You know, for being my best friend's boyfriend, I probably couldn't have gotten a nicer guy. He never talked shit to me. He never was disrespectful or rude to me. And um, so I doubt that I would have had a problem with him, even though fucking Michelle did. And I never liked Michelle. I thought she was a, a harsh bitch, and I didn't think that she was a good friend to you. But I didn't want to tell you to ditch her, because you guys had been friends since you were a little kid. But I just... I mean, I, I know it's not really personal, or at least I hope it's not, Whoa. but it felt very personal to me that I lost my best friend. Like, I just it, didn't understand it wasn't, it, what happened. 
honest to godly, what happened was I quit calling people. I just quit calling people. And then I lost phone numbers. And then we didn't have a fucking phone. And Jesus Christ. Yeah. It just made me really sad because I couldn't. I, I even could. if you, if I knew you didn't have a phone, I would have come to your house. You know what I mean? I'd have come, left a note, <laughs> whatever. If I'd have known where you lived, I'd have just been like, ah, I'm gonna go see if Nikki's home. And I would have just driven down to where you lived and seen you. Like it, for me, it would have been easy on my end to maintain contact. And I understand it was harder on your end for reasons, you know? I understand your circumstances were really totally different from mine, but I missed you in my life so much. And then when we go back and talk about when you guys were here and I had no idea you were here, I can't help thinking like so much time we could have enjoyed each other's company and we couldn't because I didn't know you were here. It just breaks me up. I had to hide who I was there. I had to change every time I walked out the door. I had to change who I was so that I could survive there. Had I been less vicious or less stubborn, I wouldn't be here. You have to start thinking about where you're going to sleep next. You don't have time to grieve. And it I realized that I got, I've got i gotten very good at hiding my bipolar and my PTSD and my generalized anxiety disorder. And, and people don't realize the struggle that that, that is. I didn't know if she was schizophrenic or not. <laughs> <laughs> we and weren't so, sure. Yeah, I mean, come on, of course, if you're not, you're just severely bipolar, but still, you know, <laughs> and so it's... I'm there with this person who's alternating between one minute, oh, it's fine, we'll recover from this, honey, we're, no big deal, she, we'll be back on our feet in no time, we'll get a better apartment, you know, and the next minute, holy shit, we're never going to recover, oh my god, well, we just fucking die, oh my god, you know, <laughs> holy shit, it's the worst thing ever happens, you know, and so I'm just like trying to be in the middle of it. <laughs> I spent a lot of time like that, you know, but when we weren't under severe stress, it was... She had a, a schedule, you know, a, a cycle, <laughs> if you will. You know, I could plan yeah. on about, you know, one week or three days out of the month, she'd be really, really bad one way or another, you know, either super manic, or well, she'd just be manic, you know. <laughs> and uh, the rest of the time, it was okay. And, you know, I guess was, I'm assuming it was probably your intellect that has always kept you even enough to, you know, make it to your 30s without needing medication. You know. yeah, like they used, knocked down a bunch of shit to put more shit up. When we lived at the Motel 5, uh -huh. we would walk under this every day. And there's down here, I'm wondering if it's still here. There's a, a, a leak of something. A what? A leak of something. Okay. That does never, it, it never evaporates and it never freezes. Huh. And so there's always a puddle down here on the right hand side. That dog's tongue is hanging way out. They've been walking for a while, but he was still happy. <laughs> Tired dogs are usually happy dogs. You wouldn't think that I would care, but I want to feel nostalgic for Colorado. I want... I want to have that. And I don't.
Okay. Why is Denver so bad? Well, Colorado. And Colorado is so bad because of things like the gentleman that's on my birth certificate. He has anemia. And it's a treatable form of anemia. But they're letting him die because he can't afford the treatment and his insurance won't cover it. Did I ticked? Uh, Coming back from that liquor store? I know. When that guy asked me for 50 cents? I, yeah. I saw all I could see was grinding his face into the pavement. And enjoying it. that's not what I wanted to be. <sighs> anyway, so things weren't looking good for us. <clears throat> yeah. Anyway, so what do we do? Okay, asset check. We sell what we had, which was a computer, and decide that we want to move somewhere. We didn't know where. We asked each other and we, we decided, Let, let's, let's go to a coast. Okay, we, you know, we never lived on a coast. I had lived on the Gulf Coast, but that doesn't count. Anyway, it's a whole other story. <laughs> but, okay, so fine, let's go to the East Coast, West Coast. Don't know where, you know. And how the culture was different never occurred to me. I had been raised that a city was a city was a city, and that they were all the same. The resources we had at the time was a public library. So we went to the public library and looked at um, the LA Times, San Francisco Chronicle, New York Times, you know, trying to get an idea of what rents are, jobs available, standard, you know, oh my God, we gotta move type of stuff, you know, even though we knew we were gonna be homeless when we got there. Microsoft Encarta Encyclopedia. It was a two disc set, come <laughs> on. It was on. a two disc set that, you know, <laughs> had little, Factoids really is what we would call them now. I mean, it's an it's amazingly small amount of information to call itself an encyclopedia, but it did. <clears throat> Wikipedia has more. It, it, it worked down to New York or San Francisco. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, literally, we knew the same amount about each of them, really, which is nothing. <laughs> this is pre internet days, don't forget that, kids. <clears throat> and so we flipped a coin, you know, literally, it came up heads. Coin flip. Okay, so there we were. <sighs> okay, so we flipped the goddamn coin. In the goddamn coin! <laughs> <laughs> so we got on the bus with what we could carry on our back, two one way bus tickets from Denver to San Francisco, and you know, about 50, 60 bucks in cash. And that was it, you know? <laughs> was a decision and it was a load off my mind that I wasn't going to be stuck in Colorado in the snow and see something else struggle right. probably yeah, struggle somewhere else you know <laughs> I mean, you're gonna freaking struggle no matter what you do now so you want to do it here you want to do it yeah somewhere next to the ocean <laughs> you know? well I'd never seen the exactly, ocean exactly exactly you begin to deal with it you have to you have to work with it and and become comfortable with your own pain. A lot of the reason that I'm going back is so that I can stop feeling homeless. I want to prove to myself I can leave again. And there is a belief there that homeless people are homeless because they want to be. And that's not the case. People are raised to be vicious. It's a, I should say it's highly competitive. And that, I'm not, I'm, I'm not a, well, I shouldn't say I'm not. I'm told I'm highly competitive. Probably am. So, I'm a product of my <laughs> product.
product of my environment, or at least in some ways I am. Well, they don't even have a security guy there. You can just drive right in there. Denver Animal Shelter, yes. Is that where that is? Is that it there? No, this is the Youth Empowerment Center. Denver Animal Shelter's right there. Oh, I've never been here. I've wanted to check it out because I know they always have Oh my God, and it did. And this used to be the Motel 5. Really? Yes. Look, at, did you get paused? Did, did, did I just freeze? I'm at a loss for what you need to know to understand how hard this is for me to go back to Colorado. I spent so much time trying to survive there and not doing it that there's a fear that I won't come out of there. It's like I barely escaped and now I'm going back in. It's like, it's like having been in prison and willingly walking back in to spend the night just because you can walk out again. Somebody raised me to think little of myself and that's kind of what I ended up with. thinking very little of myself and so I put things that are worth money on me trying to make me worth money. <laughs> worth something. But I've lived without it for so long that worth of self is not something that I have had a lot of and the fact that I've been poor and on the streets is just made it that much worse. People avert their eyes to those people that are on the streets instead of looking at them and smiling like they would anybody else. I sit and think Why didn't I do something else with the money? I splurged and I got myself a whole new wardrobe. It was great. Something I haven't done in 10 years. And now I feel guilty for it because I could have helped somebody have a hotel for a night or getting themselves a meal. Okay, there we go. I will adjust from there. <laughs> I don't know what to say now. I just went completely blank. All right. All right. I have broken. <sighs> then I hear that outside and I know that somebody's having a very hard time. Somebody is out of doors, somebody has no place to go, somebody's very angry at society, and I don't blame them. Not one bit because they're not taken care of and they should be. And what did I do? I got status symbols.
it's the night before I go to Colorado. And I'm so anxious that it's 7 p.m. and I'm ready for bed. Yet I'm not. I'm so anxious I can't sleep. But I know I have to get up at 4.30 in the morning so that I can have some coffee and get ready. And, and I don't think I'll sleep much past 4.30 anyway. I'm more excited now than I am scared. But the anticipation is getting me and the stress is getting me. I'll enjoy the trip once I'm moving. Yeah. Tricky mirrors. I am on the train. I am on my way. I am excited. I'm enjoying the trip so far. I've had lunch and I've been working on the movie. I've tutored a student and I feel very important. different. Not than I thought it'd be, but it's different than it's different than when we came out to, to San Francisco. It's a much better trip. I'm going first class. Had you lost hope? Yeah, I lost hope and embittered is the word. What it felt like for you to move? Okay, I gotta do it this way. I gotta ask him. How did it feel to move at my whim? I don't think it was your whim. I had thought of it myself before. You know, I didn't, wasn't for sure if you'd be that adventurous of it, you know, <laughs> but no, I, I had thought of it, so I feel like it was a mutual decision all the way. Okay, it's four in the morning and I'm over anxious. My 5 a.m. alarm is shot. I'm up. I can tell I'm still tired, but I can't sleep. I took some painkillers and I'm hoping that'll help. But food starts at 6.30. I may as well get up. I'm not upset about it. It's been so long since I've seen the stars. I may go up to the observation mount as soon as I get dressed. Everybody here has been so nice. I'm in the Rocky Mountains. I'm watching snow and mountain and sunrise and there's a part of me that misses it there's a part of me that misses the 
the hills and the, the snow. All of it. No, not all of it. Just parts of it. I'm trying to remember the good parts because the bad parts have so overwhelmed me. And this is getting more and more exciting as I go. I'm going to be leaving here in first class too. I'm arriving in first class, and I'm leaving in first class. That just made my heart skip a beat. Okay, apparently I'm in Cisco, Utah. Another town where if you spit, you miss it. And that's okay. Meeker is a town where you spit, you miss it. And that's Meeker, Colorado. It's where my family's from. It's where, well, my mom's side of the family is from. Many, 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 many years into the past. Not far enough to count as a native, but far enough to have done some horrible, horrible things. When we got kicked out of that little apartment that we had in Denver, that we've been there for five years, you know, of course, it's super traumatic. And, you know, I'm going through all this with an unmedicated bipolar. <laughs> Hotel in Denver, we flip a coin to the side between New York and San Francisco. And, I mean, literally, it was just picking up the chance that <laughs> San Francisco got chosen. So, we sold everything we had, pawned it, you know, sold it, whatever. Got on a bus, and three days later, <laughs> here we are. And I, I'll never forget leaving Colorado, when everything was so dry. It was right before a major fire. I mean, the time we got here... Before, you know, the wildfires had started there that year. It was horrible. <laughs> but we saw that leaving the state every time we stop and, you know, step off the bus and stretch our legs, look around, and it's just everything is so dry. <laughs> uh, we get to California border right before it, you know. Well, the bus driver announces we're coming to the border, you know, get ready to get rid of any fruit and vegetables, you know, since California has that thing. <clears throat> Kid in front of us pops up, turns around, hey, how are you guys? You want an orange? <laughs> Got to get rid of them anyway, you know. <laughs> I don't know, cool, you know, hey, how's it going? And we started chatting, you know. His name was Chance. Um, great kid, he was 17, you know. We were, what, we were 31, 32 at the time. 30, you know, 31. He didn't care, you know. That was what was so great about it, you know. But it was just that, that and we looked at other people while we're sitting there talking to him, and everybody on the bus just kind of starts talking. And it was just a total different vibe coming into California. You know, I swear to God, it sounds stupid, but we crossed that border and people just got more friendly. You know, yeah. <laughs> got more friendly, they got nicer, they got more communicative. <clears throat> it was amazing, you know, it really was. Got into town, <coughs> to the good old Greyhound station there. <laughs> okay, I'm still on the train. And I keep watching snow-covered mountains in the distance. And as the sun shines in, I've got my sparkle blouse on, so it looks sort of like a disco ball. I'm anxious. I'm excited. And the closer I get, the easier it feels. I just hope I can maintain my own me. I've worked hard to be me. I like me. I love me. And that is a recent thing. Not that I wasn't a lovable person before. 
I just didn't know how to love myself. Okay, so it's six o'clock my time. Seven o'clock here. I should be fine. <laughs> But I got up at 4.30 this morning again. Well, actually, I got up at 3. Almost 4. Cattails. Used to make wishes on cattails when I was little. Well, you know, just being in San Francisco, we found an SRO <laughs> on 7th and Folsom. It's gone now, so I guess we can say it <laughs> where it is. Yeah, 7th and on Folsom. On 7th and Folsom in Soma there. Uh, we had enough for one night. Stayed there one night. Um, cuddled in, in one bed, even though it had bunk beds. But, you know, we were young and thin, so we could do that. <laughs> yeah, we wouldn't do that now. <laughs> no, no, no. <clears throat> Not now. Anyway... <laughs> <laughs> Pardon me. <laughs> yeah, so we stayed there one night um, watching local news on our little TV with this little you know, one inch, I think. Uh, it's two and a half inches. Well, yeah, with the, the antenna on it and you know, you stick it in your pocket, basically. But it had a color, a color screen, a color yeah. TV. It was impressive. Had a little, uh, little roll right. knob on it to get your station in. Oh, of course, in. of course. You know, it's just like little transistor radios. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, stayed there one night, recouped, took a shower, that kind of stuff. Um, and next day we went out to Golden Gate Park where Chance had told us to go. Okay, I'm in Colorado now. I'm working on what you need to know to understand where I am emotionally. It doesn't look like it. It just feels like it. I am anxious and scared and wildly angry and yet I have a whole portion of me that that doesn't care, that wants to just show it, that needs to just show where we were to prove that, oh well, I'm out to prove something. <sighs> well, today I saw Fred's daughter, and I don't have any else done. Okay, let's get a decent, I can't tell. In any case, it's been a hell of a week. It's been fun. It's been interesting. And I'm not looking forward to going home. I want to spend more time here. I mean, I'm looking forward to leaving for certain reasons, but not really. Okay, yesterday I saw Fred's daughter. That was an interesting go-round. She was sweet and kind. And 
she apologized to me, which I did not expect. When I found out that Fred died, I was more upset that nobody told me because I thought they had my number on Fred's phone and just didn't bother to call me. When I found out that wasn't the case, I was no longer upset. I can understand I'm just the stepdaughter. And I, in their eyes, and, and I understand that. I know that's different now. But in any case, You know, as my partner, of course, you know, and when she says I can see a ghost, I, of course, I believe her because I can tell she was telling the truth, you know, coming to find out later, it was <laughs> hallucinations, but still, you know, and so we're going, going through these really traumatic times and, you know, one minute she's like, oh, it's okay, we'll get through this, no problem, we'll come back stronger than ever, you know, and the next minute it's like, holy Jesus fucking God, how did this happen? <laughs> you know, and I was like. <laughs> and I couldn't help you know? it. But that's life with an unmedicated bipolar, you know? I mean, perfectly calm, maybe have a nap, and she'll walk up and go, ah! You know? <laughs> yeah, where did we leave off with the tale there? In Denver, we told him we came here. Mm hmm The first SRO. And, you know, find hippie, I'll be there. We're like, yeah, sure, right, whatever. But sure as, sure as shit, he was there. Yeah. You know, right? Chance was gone. You know, and he... That day he gave us the lowdown on so much stuff, you know, everything about it. everything from the free eats in town to, you know, what an SROs are, all that kind of stuff. You know, basically he Californiaized us yeah. <laughs> within the first couple of days, you, you know, and then we lived in the park for the next three months. Was it three? It three was weeks. three months. No, it was three it was, months. Okay, for three months. So we became citizens of San Francisco, California, you know, had our... <laughs> IDs and everything. Uh, then we were able to apply for, you know, some kind of public assistance. The first public assistance we got, we went back to the same place, because it, it was a nice place and affordable, and bought a week there. You know, that's all we had. We were going to have a week, and then we were going to be back out for three weeks until our benefits came the next month, and then... Back <laughs> in a week. Yeah, you know, that's how we were figuring it, you know. But, of course, we were looking for a job the whole time. And uh, on the on the last night there, I mean, we were got to leave, at, you know, eleven o'clock the next day. Or last night there, um, from talking to people and you know, just being friendly, being California types, you know, we find out that the the SRO hotel we're living at uh, was looking for people, and that's exactly what we had done in Denver, you know, <laughs> worked at a motel, and so we were both hired on as desk help and. You know, on the last night, it was bing, now you got a job, and you have a job where you live, so of course you're not going to get kicked out of where you live, <laughs> you know? And then there's free eats in town, so you can, yeah. you you eat. Yeah, you know, people care if you have eaten or not, things like that. It's just amazing, you know, and it really has been for us. The things that you remember are the things that, for whatever reason, made you laugh, made you cry, gave you a heightened emotion of some sort. Well, those are the things I remember.
She's got to be tall. Y'all want to wait, you're probably going to bring another golf cart around. Lovely Chicago onboard service crew who's been with you the entire way. We're taking you all the way to Grand Junction, Colorado. Trying to get some mechanical issues solved here, and then we're going to get out of town. So, Conductor Dana's up front, talking with our engineers, trying to figure out a solution. Then we're going to depart Denver Union Station. Conductors will be walking through immediately after we depart. Once again, folks, just holding here for a mechanical issue. Of course. I can't leave Denver. I want a, I want a shot of me taking off. But it doesn't look like I'll get it. I'm on the train home. It's not moving yet. The train outside is. But we're not yet. I get to go home. I feel very much like my past has been erased. So much of what was there isn't there anymore. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't that bad, even though we found out later we were being screwed over by... <laughs> they were not paying a San Francisco minimum wage. They were paying Denver wages, and also when you live where you work, you're supposed to get a huge discount on rent, and they were not giving us discounted rent. <laughs> Have you, you tell the story about the fire yet? No, but we're yeah. getting we're getting to it because we want to come up to current. Yeah. So we lived there for a year and a half, or two years. Mm, two years. Two years. Yeah. So we lived there for two years, and then one morning we woke up to somebody out in the alleyway screaming, Emery Nikki ain't no fucking joke, there's a goddamn fire! Because we're used to people in the hallways yelling, you know, it was just, it was that kind of place. And so I hop up, and uh, I always kept a, a towel in the door. Because uh, we smoked at the time, we didn't want to bother other people as well as we didn't like other people's smells coming into our room. So, we just our, you know, so it happened to be plugged already. Well, pull it open, and you know, and smoke didn't come in because then I wouldn't open the door. But you could smell it all of a sudden. Like, oh God, it reeked, you know. I open the door, stick my head outside. <laughs> you know, I need to keep it down in case there is a flashover. I stick my head outside, and. Two, do two doors down, I can see orange, you know, orange flame inside there. And I look up, and it's just this thick carpet of black smoke on the, you know, ceiling. Just, I mean, that freaking thick. And it's just, okay, time to go. <laughs> Close the door, plug it up, and grab some stuff. And out the window we went to our fire escape, <laughs> you know. And so that's how the story is that we lost our home and our job in the same day. <laughs> For the same reason. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, hey, fire. Kind of unique, huh?
Ranch. That was originally laid out by uh, the tunnel workers when they were like a base camp from when they were building the tunnel back there. I'm on my way home. We've made it through Granby. Or no, Granby's our next station. It was fun spending time with Jen. We haven't done it in so long. I missed her. Seeing the places I was homeless was easier with her, knowing that she'd take me home. I didn't have to get out of the car. I didn't have to... I didn't have to be outdoors. It's a lot of what's happened since I've been homeless. I don't want to go outside anymore. I'm so excited to be going home. I can't wait to see my husband. I can't wait to see my cats. You know, I swear I'm more excited than I was going to Colorado. Not that I didn't miss Jen horribly. I, I'm, I do. I already miss her. But San Francisco's home. Home is stressful because I have so much to do, but I'm really looking forward to being home. I miss Jen. I wish she could come over. I wish we could spend the night with each other more often. But I'm glad I live in San Francisco. Even having visited and everybody being nice, still, there's a hardness to Colorado that hasn't gone away, and I'm just not willing to put up with it. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and so uh, basically after the the week of help from the Red Cross ran out after that, you're out on the streets, you're homeless, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, our situation at the time was we couldn't go back to the park. They had made it to where you could go up on that hill now. <laughs> so you couldn't go live in the park anymore. So we went down and lived on the, on the beach, you know, Ocean Beach, at the end of the end line. Get off the end line, go across the great highway, and take a right. And the third sand dune on the right, that's where we lived. Basically right inside there. <laughs> yeah. They're not just spouses or partners, too. Yeah. Important. Ah, uh, you did remember to turn on the microphone, right? Mm hmm Okay. The microphone is automatically on. Ah, uh, nice. Yeah, you know, you cover up at night. You, you know, you, you can't pitch a tent. Oh, no, you can only do that on the beach itself, so there's no wind protection. <laughs> But you know, if you're going to sleep outside, you, you know, put your blanket over your head and so forth. It was very, very cold. Yes, it was. It was very cold. But it was kind of beautiful, too. You're on the beach the whole time, you know, and, uh, you know, you got to see dolphins, you know, catch crabs every now and again. 
you know, saw this wonderful owl that would hunt at night. You, I mean, I swear, you could, it looked like you could just reach out and touch it, you know, and of course, just silent, you know, and every night I'm going to see, dive down and you hear the rats, <laughs> yeah, a lot of rats on the beach. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. There is no guarantee of anything. There is no guarantee. There is no safety net. Well, shit. I knew I wasn't logical, but I was trying to figure out where I went wrong, and nobody would listen to me long enough. <sighs> What's the problem with anybody with mental illness, myself included? <laughs> you gotta jump to that emotional level right away, or they'll get upset with you. <laughs> Well, it feels like nobody ever Of course, listens. you know, I mean, to you, you're in a perfectly logical state, and so if anybody else isn't in that state that you are, they're being illogical, you yep. know? I always understood that, but fortunately, with her high intellect, she always was smart enough to realize when she was being completely unreasonable <laughs> and so forth, <laughs> so... It may have taken what, me a minute. <laughs> well, that's, that's, that's how we stay married for so long, you know, I'm not just a glutton for punishment, <laughs> I am um, right now grateful that we've come off of the, that they've pulled us off of the wait list for Section 8. I am um, still struggling. But I'm better off now than I was before. So anyway, finally, three months later, they finished repairing the, the one room and the smoke damage, and we got to move back in. <laughs> and then, like, within, Jesus, within a, within a month of that, kind of found out that they sold the building. <laughs> Which is why it reopened. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, pretty much. That's why it reopened, too. But they had sold the building. It was no longer going to be an SR hotel. Now it was going to be a drug rehab. <laughs> oh, but you're welcome to stay if you want to keep paying rent. <laughs> was the message we got. And so, you know, we put on our cute little coat and tie and went down there and talked to the new owners who bought the master lease. You know, and we pointed out that uh, I was in the middle of suing them for, un you know, unpaid wages and overcharge of rent and almost certain to win. You know, it, it'll be a little bit different now if I have to sue them personally, but, you know, I have this case against the master lease of this building is what it was. And they just bought the master lease. <laughs> I'm in a state that cares whether I live or I die, that cares whether I'm educated, that cares whether or not I'm healthy mentally as well as physically. Maybe not as much as I would like, but they do care. So I'm like, okay, so that kind of transfers to you. So basically, you owe us about eight months of rent. <laughs> Just look on the face. Uh, uh. <laughs> and so they thought about it for a couple of days and came back to me and offered me a job. <laughs> and just got a rent, you know. And it's actually, it was actually a very good thing because it, it worked its way on the, the person who had bought the lease on the building was turned into rehab. He had another business, which was um, a pre-press house. Um, you guys can look up what that is. It's basically making printing plates. Film Everything for it plates. takes to get it from the idea to the actual magazine. Yeah, you know, some graphic design, that sort of thing. But that's where I, I learned all that from. And it was, you know, and it's been quite amazing. You know, it's been my career since then. You know, for graphic design of all kinds. You know, 2D especially, but I can do all kinds. Yes. You know, they even went to college for it. <clears throat> and that's pretty much how we got to, you know, the next, what, stable seven, ten years of our lives. Yeah. You know, living here, San Francisco. Well, how did we? <laughs> that's how we got off the streets that time. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they opened them back up. You know, it worked for Richard. Yes. You know, and I was uh, wound up working for uh, Shepard. And then 
and I and I left and worked for Phoebus Lighting. Oh, yes, and you went to Phoebus. And then and we, went, then to we went to Louisiana, so I could go to college. And, and then we came I back. I guarantee you fell through again. We came back, couldn't find a job quick enough, went up homeless again, spent the next year in a shelter, because now we're too old to be living outside. Yeah, my body's sort of broken uh -huh. down. I can't right. carry what I used to carry. Uh huh. That Little kind of things. thing. And I, from all the crap that happened in Louisiana, I was just broken mentally and disabled. You know, so something that you know the world should take more seriously. It's just that. I mean, I eventually had to sue and eventually won Social Security disability for mental health reasons. Because of that, you know, I couldn't perform the type of job I was doing before I went to Louisiana anymore. So, hence disability. And I've been on there ever since, you know, and here we are ten years later. Yeah. <sighs> now you're up to speed. <laughs> yep. There we go. And we're back where we started. I'm at a loss for what to say. I've told my story. I've had my husband tell our story. And I've told it in a manner that is consistent with my brain. At least mostly. <laughs>